Welcome back to Memories of Murder, an Asian true crime podcast. Please be forewarned that today's episode contains some graphic depictions of violence and torture. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on the show and hear some of the other cases that you'd like me to cover moving forward. So please check out Memories of Murder on social media or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Now, on with the show. In the early hours of January 4th, 1989, a group of teenagers are gathered at an ordinary two-story suburban home in Tokyo. There are four boys and one girl, and they're playing mahjong. The girl seems to be winning, and as she continues her winning streak, the boys begin to get angry and frustrated. At around 8am, the group begin beating the girl, first with just their hands and feet, and then by repeatedly dropping a metal exercise bar on her body. As blood splatters across the room, they wrap plastic bags around their hands because they don't want to get blood on themselves. The beatings go on and on. Still unsatisfied, the group melts wax into the girl's eyes and pours lighter fluid on her legs and sets them on fire. Eventually, the girl goes into convulsions and falls unconscious. The gang of boys proceeds to tie her up to stop her from escaping and decides that they'll go out for a sauna. The girl never recovers from her injuries and dies later that day alone and in unimaginable pain. The girl's name was Junko Furuto and her death marked the end of a 44-day ordeal of pain and torture. Despite the truly heinous nature of what was done to Junko and the young age of the culprits, not much is said about her death today. Sure, it was widely reported at the time. One Japanese newspaper even broke protocol and named the killers. Normally, in cases where the crime is committed by a juvenile, the names will be protected. But the paper decided that in this particular case, the murderers didn't deserve anonymity. But there was very little public outrage nor was there the usual media fear-mongering that would normally accompany a case like this. And these attitudes on the national level kind of sum up what the feelings were like locally too. You see, quite a few people knew what was happening to Junko, maybe even hundreds, and nobody did a thing about it. This was a case that could have easily been prevented. People knew what was going on, and at one point the police were even called in. But in the end, Junko died anyway. At around 8.30pm on the evening of November 25th, 1988, Junko Furuta was cycling home from her part-time job. It was a job that she liked and a job that she was good at. At her funeral, the owners of her place of employment promoted her to a full-time staff member and she was buried alongside her uniform. She was a hard-working girl and she was well-liked. Now, as she makes her way home, from out of nowhere, an assailant runs up beside her and kicks her off her bike and runs off. As she begins picking herself up off the floor, a familiar face shows up. Junko sees that it's Hiroshi Miyano, a local thug that had been pursuing her romantically, but whom she had turned down repeatedly. Now let's skip back a few hours earlier. Miyano and his friend Nobuharu Minato are two bored teenagers, local hooligans looking to get up to no good. While most teenagers might go to the arcade or hang out at a park, these two decide that they'll take a walk and look for women that they could potentially rob and rape. It's not the first time they've done this. They had a history of kidnapping and raping young girls, but unfortunately they were never caught for those crimes. It's already dark when the pair spot Junko riding on her bike coming home from work. Miano tells Minato to run up and kick her off her bike and that he'll handle the rest. As Miano rushes in like a white knight and helps up the day's Junko, he tells her that the guy that kicked her off her bike could be dangerous, that he might have had a knife, and that he'll walk her home to make sure she gets there safely. Despite knowing of Miano's reputation, Junko decides to allow him to accompany her home. We'll never know if she decided to trust him that day or if she was just scared of what saying no might entail, but it was a mistake that would cost her dearly. Now, obviously, Miano doesn't take her home and succeeds in leading Junko to a nearby warehouse. Once they arrive, he explains to her that he's well-connected, that he's friends with the local Yakuza and threatens her, and says that if she has sex with him, nothing else bad will happen. After he rapes her, he calls Minato to boast about what he's done. 
Presumably, Junko is in earshot, he wouldn't have led her out of his sight, and she must have heard what happened next. Minato tells Miyano, don't let her go just yet. He and a couple of their other friends want their turn. So at about 3am in the darkness of a local park, Junko is confronted by four boys. Their names are Hiroshi Miyano, Nobuharu Minato, Joe Ogura and Yasushi Watanabe. They search through her belongings and after finding her address on a notebook inside her bag, they tell her to do as she's told or the Yakuza will pay a visit to her family. She complies and is taken back to the Minato family home where she's gang raped by all four of the boys. As bad as that sounds, that was just the beginning of Junko's ordeal. An ordeal that would last 44 days and see her subjected to some of the worst torture imaginable. Before we get into that, I'd like to look back at the mastermind of this murder, Hiroshi Miyano. Miyano was born in 1970 to a well-off middle-class family. His life was a little dysfunctional, but there was nothing too out of the ordinary. He'd gotten in trouble for stealing and bullying while he was at primary school, but nothing too dramatic. But as he got older, he became interested in judo and began getting into trouble, often fighting with older kids. He even became violent at home, causing his father to call the school and ask for help. But despite all of the trouble that he got into, it seemed he was still loved and cared for by his parents. They even gave him a car when he turned 18. But then, at some point, Miano decides to join a motorcycle gang. And it's there that his reputation and connections led him to become involved with the Yakuza. Now, this was the late 80s, the bubble years of Japan's economy. And with all of that money circulating around the country, came organised crime looking for their slice of the action. They didn't need to hide in the shadows like the Mafia. Yakuza weren't illegal in Japan. Everyone knew who they were and what it meant to cross them. And as Miano became more involved with them, he even ran one of their local offices for a time, people began to become more wary of him, ignoring some of his lesser crimes purely for their own safety. They didn't want to get involved. And this is an important fact that will directly impact on what happens to Junko. By November the 27th, 1988, Two days after her kidnapping, Junko's parents finally call the police to report her missing, but it's not clear how seriously this report was taken by the police. And somehow, her captors had found out that the police were searching for Junko, and so they forced her to call her parents and tell them that she'd run away, that she didn't want to be found, and that the police should stop looking for her. Why her parents, or the police, would have believed that story is beyond comprehension. Everything we know about her, she was a good girl at school with a job and had a happy home life. There was no reason that she would run away. But regardless, both her parents and the police seemed satisfied with this call and decided to call the search off. Now, for the first few days, Junko's life with the gang at Minato's home must have seemed incredibly surreal. She was repeatedly raped, but she never tries to escape. She's even introduced to Minato's parents and his brother, and at one point, she even shares a family meal with them. It's after this meal that Minato's mother tells the scared-looking girl that she should go home. But at this, Minato becomes furious and tells his parents they shouldn't interfere and that they're not to go upstairs or enter his room from now on. Minato's parents are presumably the first people outside of the gang to know what is happening to Junko. Later, they tell the courts that they were too scared of Miano and his Yakuza connections, and so they couldn't do anything about it. Following the exchange between herself and Minato's mother, Junko gets one last burst of courage. While everyone in the house is asleep, she finally calls the police. But before she can say anything, she gets scared and she hangs up the phone, and unfortunately for her, the police actually do their job this time, and they call back. However, Miano is also at the house, and it's him that answers the phone, and he tells them there's been a mistake and that there's nobody at the house and there's nothing for them to be concerned about. But from then on out, for Junko, everything changes. Furious that Junko would try to escape or report them to the police, the gang begin to systematically torture her. I won't get into everything they did to her, but needless to say, it's horrific. They beat her repeatedly, sometimes with heavy weights that they also used to crush her hands and break her fingers. They burnt her, 
forced her to drink her own urine, made her sleep outside in the harsh winter weather, and they even hung her up and used her body as a punching bag. All of this punishment that they dished out put a huge strain on Junko's body. After a while, she could no longer walk, and it would take her over an hour to drag herself to the bathroom. The gang even stopped feeding her, and she began to show signs of malnutrition. Things became so bad that she lost control of her bladder and bowels, and when she tried to drink, she would immediately throw up. The gang would then beat her up again for making the room dirty. At her autopsy, the coroner would later comment that, because of this cruel treatment, Junko's brain had actually begun to shrink, and she was suffering from hearing loss. Remember, this is after 44 days. How bad must this torture have been? Junko would even just beg the gang to kill her, to end her suffering and be done with it. But they refused, and the beatings just got harder. The continuous punishments quickly began to affect Junko's appearance as well. Her face became grotesquely swollen, and foul-smelling pus began oozing from the wounds where the gang had set her body on fire repeatedly. And with this change in appearance, the gang lost interest in her sexually. In fact, they even went so far as to abduct another woman that they gang-raped at a nearby hotel. Luckily for her, this woman was released, but it makes you wonder, if they were content to let the other woman go after raping her without fear of getting caught, then why didn't they let Junko go? We've already established that Nobuharu Minato's parents knew what was going on and that he also had a brother that was complicit in the crime. But these weren't the only people that had an inkling of what was happening. Court documents suggest that at least 16 other people were involved in the crime, and that's including three women. But only two people were charged. Other sources suggest that over 100 people may have been involved with raping Junko, although no one else has ever been charged. If this is indeed true, then people in the neighbourhood must have suspected something. They must have seen these people going in and out of the house and realised that something strange was happening at the Minato household. The only other people to be charged were Koichi Ihara and Tetsuo Nakamura, whose DNA was found on Junko's body. Koichi Ihara claims that he was bullied into participating in Junko's rape. He told his brother, who then told their parents, who then told the police. Two officers were then sent over to investigate the Minato residence. And this is perhaps the most infuriating part of the case. The officers went to the house, they rang the doorbell, and when somebody answered, they asked, are there any young girls inside? They were told, no, there's not. You can come in and search if you like. But they declined. If only they'd gone in. This was just 16 days into Junko's abduction, long enough that she would have already been showing signs of her physical abuse, and they could have put an end to it right then. Junko would have been reunited with her family, and that would have been the end of it. But in the end, their failure to conduct a proper search meant Junko would die, and the two policemen would lose their jobs. To me, it's unbelievable that all of these people could have known about Junko. Even if people were scared of repercussions by the Yakuza, surely such a large group of people, an entire neighbourhood, could have done something. How could only one of them have had conscience enough to say anything? After hearing of the viciousness of the crimes, I wonder if the Yakuza would have even protected Miyano and the gang anyway. They're not known for these type of crimes, and such actions by their members would ruin their standing in the community. It's not something that an organisation such as the Yakuza would have wanted, especially at the height of Japan's economic power. But in the end, despite the number of people that knew about the crime, it was the gang's own stupidity that led to their capture. On the night of Junko's death, after the gang had finished playing Mahjong and Junko had received her final beating, the gang had gone on to a sauna and then on to another hangout spot run by the Yakuza. They soon get a call from Minato's brother telling them that Junko isn't breathing and that she appears to be dead. Now, instead of going back to check the body, calling the police, doing something that could have possibly saved Junko, instead, Miano goes out, gets hold of a cement mixer, an oil drum and a truck and the gang go back to the house, grab Junko's body and stuff it into the drum and then surround it with wet cement. This is what led to the murder being known as the concrete encased high school girl murder. I'm sure that translates much better in Japanese. Following this, the gang does seem a little worried that they'll be caught for the murder, so they plan to drive to the sea, deciding that dumping the body there will be their safest bet. But halfway there, they have a change of heart. 
and because they're too lazy and too stupid, they leave the oil drum at an empty building site instead. And that would have been the end of it. That is, if they hadn't continued to commit crimes and weren't incredibly stupid. On January 23rd, 19 days after Junko died, Miyano and Joe Ogura are arrested for the rape of a 19-year-old woman back in December, the one that they'd abducted when they'd tired of Junko. They're held under detention until March 29th, when police finally send interrogators to pay them a visit. During this interrogation, the police play the pair against each other, and due to some suspicious evidence, they decide that they could try and trick them into admitting to other crimes. Bear in mind this is without any hard evidence. The officer casually says to Miano, You shouldn't have gone and murdered anyone. Now this may sound like questionable conduct, but the trick works. And thinking that Joe Ogura had confessed to the murder, Miano immediately apologises for the murder and tells the police exactly where to find Junko Furato's body. The next day, police discover her badly decomposed corpse exactly where the gang had left it. If the crimes against Junko had been enough to shock you, what happened during the sentencing will leave you even more horrified. Each of the gang were given what many believe to be incredibly light sentences given the viciousness of their crimes. Because each of the boys pled guilty, the judge decided to be lenient, sentencing them for just bodily harm resulting in death rather than murder. He even went so far as to say that the gang had shown deep remorse and had pledged to become better members of society in the future. Hiroshi Miyano was given 17 years, which was bumped to 20 off of a failed appeal. Nobuharo Minato, who originally received a four to six year sentence, was resentenced to five to nine years on appeal. Yasushi Watanabe served just seven years in prison, while Joe Ogura spent just eight years in prison. Today, all four members of the gang have been released from prison. The murder of Junko Furuta is especially sad as it feels like not only could it have been prevented, but that justice wasn't truly served. As adults, the gang would have served life in prison or perhaps have received the death penalty. As it stands, they were released in their mid-30s and allowed to return to society and live relatively normal lives. Furthermore, the case itself seems largely forgotten by a wider Japanese public, perhaps because of the shame felt by those involved and the failure to provide justice to the Ferrata family. The case was adapted into several novels and movies, but outside of its shocking details and entertainment value, it's not much talked about today. It's also sad to think of Junko. It's easy to ask, why didn't she try to escape? But the answer to that is that she probably thought that she would be released, that it would all be over soon. By the time that she realised it was never going to end, she could no longer walk and it was too late. This has been Memories of Murder, an Asian true crime podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe via Apple Podcast or wherever it is that you get your podcasts and check in for more content on the Memories of Murder social media feed. That's all for now. Thank you for listening and good night.